All right, you guys ready? Galatians chapter 5, here we go. Galatians 5, we're going to start in 13. We're going to read all the way through verse 26 as we usually do so we can get the context. Here we go. Galatians 5, 13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But... If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, and here's our key verse, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, Let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So back in verse 22, that's our key verse. We're looking at the fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness. We've covered all those so far. And then last week we started on which one? That's sad. (laughs) you, You guys just weren't ready for it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. faithfulness. All right, cool. So last week, and I want to show these pictures, not to cover too much of what we did last week, but it's, if you weren't here last week, it's not really going to make a whole lot of sense of why we have hurricane pictures up there. But go ahead and show this first picture. There it is. Okay. So this is Gilchrist, Texas. After Hurricane Ike in 2008, it was only a Category 2 storm, and we say that because to us Keys people, it's like, let's stock the fridge a little bit better, buy like three more gallons of water, and we're good, right? Well, this absolutely, this was a flooding storm and just wiped out Gilchrist, Texas, this really small community, except for one house. Except, there it is. (laughs) Sorry. I think the slides are a little lagging today. So... This one house, the owners had been in a storm before, and way, way, way before this storm was even thought of, before anyone knew it was going to come, they contacted builders, they contacted architects, they forked out a lot of money, and they fortified this house to be ready for a storm. That's quite a picture, isn't it? That's quite an example for us to look and say, um, I don't even know what that blue and green thing is to the left there, but say, say that concrete pad that's right next to the house. Would you rather, after a storm, and of course now we're talking about the storms in life, would you rather be that empty concrete pad, or would you like to be that house that stood strong? I'm sure it was buffeted, I'm sure it had some damage, I'm sure, like, but it stood, didn't it? And, and that's what we're talking about, church. That's this, this faithfulness that we're talking about. When we learn how to be faithful to God, when, when we look at God's word as something that we cherish, something that is not just a book that's on the shelf that we dust off and we bring on a Sunday morning maybe, or we look at it more as something like, oh my goodness, this is God's word. Like, he would have written this just to me. Like, this has instruction for every single area of my life. 
And when I am going through a storm, I can look at what God says, that God is going to, he has promised he is going to be there with me. Not that he's going to just step in and fix everything right away, because God allows us to go through storms. But what happens in those storms? He grows us. He strengthens us. And probably the most important thing, he puts us in situations where if we choose to do the right thing, what do we do? We hold him closer. We, we, we say, God, I, I need you. I am in a storm right now. Maybe we caused our own mess of a storm. Uh, maybe it just happened upon us. It doesn't really matter. But if we draw in near to God, it says he will draw near to us. And see, that's what I want for us, church. I want us to be faithful, not just as a church, as Island Community Church, as a part of the Big C Church, but as individuals, because guess what? I know some of you are going through storms right now. I know some of your stories. I have spoken to some of you in the last few weeks, and I know that there are some storms right now going on in life. And I need you to know that there is a God that loves you, that is full of grace, full of mercy, full of love and compassion that is waiting for you. Like, he's right there. Revelation chapter 3, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone comes to me and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. It's a very, very intimate setting to come in and eat with somebody back then. And, and, and Jesus is saying, hey, I'm ready to come in. I want to be right there with you. I want to walk through the storm with you. That's the God that we serve. And that's the God that is calling us to be faithful to him. But church, we can't be close to him if we're not being faithful to him. So I want every single one of us to be that house right there when that storm comes through because it's not an if it's a when we read these few verses matthew 7 starting in verse 24 it says therefore anyone who hears these words of mine this is jesus speaking right after the sermon on the mount and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock a firm foundation a cornerstone The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, that's so many of us who come to a church on a Sunday morning and you hear a message and you're like, that was a great message, and you go right out of these doors and you do what I do way more often than I would like to admit, is I just go back to my regular life. Or I I get up and I'm I'm diligent about my devotion and and I read and I'm like, oh God, that was so good. Thank you for showing that to me. And then it's basically, it's in one ear and out the other. That's what this second man is, is talking about here. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Don't be that other house, church. Be faithful, because God is faithful. So my title for today, Fruit of the Spirit, part 14, Remaining Faithful to the End. And that could be the very, very end. That's how God calls us to remain faithful. So we came up with our own definition of faithfulness. What exactly are you talking about, Trevor, when you're talking about faithfulness? Here it is. It's unswerving loyalty, devotion, or obedience. Three really, really, really big words that, you know, we, especially us guys, you know, guys often have a problem with this, but loyalty, devotion, or obedience. Why? Because we want to be in charge, right? Ladies, you're not completely off the hook for this one. But those are the three things that we have, we have just got to be un, have unswerving loyalty, devotion, or obedience regardless of circumstances or consequences. 
no matter what comes our way. No matter the storm, no matter how big it is, no matter how many waves there are, no matter how much the water rises. By the way, did anybody see any rain this week? I should have put a picture of my yard. Um, we live ne- This has nothing to do with the sermon. Uh, we live next to this house, and they built way up every single drop of rain. I'm not bitter at all, but this is, I'm, I'm confessing this to you right now. Um, Every drop of rain comes right around, right by my, my mailbox. I have a really nice stream sometimes, and it comes right into my yard. I had three inches of water, three and a half inches on my downstairs, and in the backyard where it's low, I bet you I had 18 inches of water. Okay. Now, ooh, I can tie this into the message. When we... <laughs> welcome to the mind of a pastor, okay? It never stops. When we built our house... We did it, and I was there for every little step, and I watched that truck come in and drill all of those holes, and I watched us, we tied, back then was $5,000 worth of steel, I still remember. Now, that's like three pieces of rebar, okay? It was a lot back then in 04 is when we did this, and we built our house. We put so much steel, just augured those holes really deep and put that concrete in and built on a firm foundation. And we inscribed those verses in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25. We wrote that reference into our slab. You know what? Come on water, come on rain, come on wind. We built a firm foundation of our house. And again, church, that's how we need to build our lives. Strong, firm foundation founded upon a rock. God's word, God himself, he is the chief cornerstone. So, here's the issue. It's really, really easy to say all this. But is remaining faithful easy? Is it actually applying it to life? Is it easy? No, it's very difficult. Why? Because we do hit storms, because we have problems, because we have friends and influences that mm, might not should be there anyway, and they're trying to draw us away from God, or you know, our friends usually have a better suggestion of what to do on Sunday morning or whenever your life group is supposed to be, and we find a lot of excuses. Well, I'll, I'll tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll read my Bible. Tomorrow I'll be more faithful. Tomorrow I'll, and then we fill in the blank. And then we just keep putting off God. That's not faithfulness, church. So faithfulness is difficult. And I'm sure it was difficult and I'm sure it was expensive to fortify that house. But it was worth it in the end. So last week, we started reading in Daniel chapter 6. If you've got your Bibles, you can just go ahead and flip to Daniel chapter 6. You may be able to tell this story better than I can. It's a very well-known story, Daniel in the lion's den. So Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. Last week, we looked at three of our facts about faithfulness. Now, I I kind of lied to you last week a little bit. I didn't lie. I changed what I was going to do. Okay, so last week I had seven facts or observations about faithfulness. We're going to have six. I took one out. I added it in something else. You'll see here in a little bit. But last week we looked at three of the six facts or observations from Daniel 6 about faithfulness. So I just want to read through the story real quick to get into it, and then we'll keep going. Daniel chapter 6, verse 1. So Daniel is, I'll just set it up, Daniel is in what was Babylon. He was, remember, they were captured by King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar died, or he just kind of faded off. Uh, Belshazzar, his son, came in. He was king for a while. There were some other kings. And now, way later on down the road, decades long, Daniel is still in uh, Babylon, or now it belongs to the Medes and the Persians. And this king, Darius, is the king. So it says, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So Daniel was one of the top three guys that were in charge of the 120 guys to rule over this entire massive kingdom. Uh, The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. 
Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, and here was that thing, I love this line, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and force the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed, that could not be changed once it was put into law. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where his windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. And here is the best line of this entire story, just as he had done before. In line with our message today, what do we call that, church? That's faithfulness. No matter what was coming, and you know what? I'm sure he knew what was coming. Daniel was going to be faithful. Verse 11. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. Daniel was faithful. So last week we said three of the facts about faithfulness. Number one, faithfulness results in blessing. And we said, that's not always a one-to-one -one correlation, not, you know, don't be faithful about something and say, okay, God, I'm ready for it. Okay, don't do that, because if you do that, you're probably not going to get it at that point. Number two, faithfulness results in persecution or opposition. Again, not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation, but oftentimes when we are living the way that we are supposed to be, people will see that, people will get jealous People will just, for some reason, take offense to it. Because you know why? Because darkness hates light. That's why. So again, not a one-to-one -one correlation. And this is my only negative in my list here. But faithfulness results in persecution or opposition. And number three, faithfulness breeds confidence. When we are faithful, we see, hey, God is faithful. What does that do? It boosts our confidence and our faith so we can be more faithful. So when a bigger storm comes, what do we do? We remain faithful. Why? Because God is faithful. And then what does that do? It increases our faith and our confidence. You see, it's just this big circle and it continues to happen. And the more and more that we are faithful, it just breeds this confidence that, hey God, I I've seen you work before and you're going to do it again. You are going to be faithful. Whatever happens in this situation, you are going to be faithful. Number four, faithfulness breeds loyalty. Do you know that? Faithfulness breeds loyalty. People naturally, not everybody, but oftentimes people naturally gravitate towards others who live lives of integrity or faithfulness. Some of the just most amazing people, like if right now, if I think of my top five most amazing people in my life, you know what they would be full of? 
integrity and faithfulness to God. 100% of the time. So it breeds this loyalty. You, you want to be near those people. Surround yourself with those people. Take care of those people wherever you can. Verse 14. When the king heard this, that Daniel broke the law that he had been tricked into putting in place, he was greatly distressed. When he was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and they tattletailed about him. That's pretty much, it might as well say that. Remember your majesty. And I can, I can hear them just remember what you say. It, it, and I get a little bit of disrespect from this. I don't know. I, I get a lot of stuff when I read scripture, just like I try to see what was going on. And it's like they're poking at the king, like the, they knew they had the king trapped, which we're going to find out real soon was a dangerous thing to do. Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. The king had this loyalty to Daniel, not only because Daniel was faithful to God, but we're going to see in a few minutes how faithful Daniel was to King Darius, which to us at first glance doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But because Daniel was faithful to him, he was very loyal. Number five, faithfulness causes others to believe. Verse 16, so the king gave the order, he had to, he couldn't change the law, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, listen to this, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment and being brought to him. And he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Listen to this. Remember, this is a pagan king. Now, he kind of sounds like a nice guy, okay? But this is a king who did not believe in Daniel's God. They believed in lots of different gods, and they, they didn't see Daniel's God necessarily always as a bad guy or we're not going to follow him. He was just maybe one of the many gods out there. But listen to what he says, because faithfulness causes others to believe. Daniel, servant of the, what's that word? The living God has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions. That's pretty cool. That's such a cool thing. Like this pagan king, like, like it's, and I say this all the time. We ought to be such faithful Christians that in our workplaces that are, I mean, I kind of have it easy because I work in a church, but like you guys who have like real jobs, okay, and you work more than one day a week, <laughs> you guys ought to be living in a way that is like, makes people look at you and go, man, I don't know what it is about him. I, I don't know, like, like, that whole Jesus thing that she's into, I'm not sure about that. But when we have a big project, I want her on my team. Like, he is the guy that is going to work hard, diligently, never skimp, and, and like, like I, I want to be near, I want him on my team. I want to hire people. I wish I had an office full of people like that. Again, not sure about it, their Jesus thing. Okay, that's cool. I'll give him Sundays off so he can go to church. I like to go out on the boat, but, you know, that's what we ought to be in our jobs because people see our faithfulness and they see, um... It's working for them. Whatever that is, I don't buy into it, but it's really working for them. And there's lots and lots of verses. The one that comes to mind is Matthew 5, 16. What does it say? Let your 
Light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We are to live in this faithful way that, that people look at us and go, I don't know, I, it's working for them. Maybe I need that in my life. Boom, mission accomplished. Because guess what, church, Christians, we've got the best thing around, amen? I mean, we've got Jesus. Like, my best friend is like the guy who created pretty much everything, okay? That's available to us, and we have to live in a way that people see it, and they're like, I want what they have. I'll try it out. And you don't have to preach this big sermon. You don't have to know all the verses. Just bring them to church. I'll do the hard work. I work really hard. Like I said, one day a week. I'll do as hard as I can. And we've got to live that way because faithfulness causes others to believe. Number six. Last one here. Faithfulness stands strong in the face of storms. There's a lot of benefits to faithfulness. This, this is a big one. Listen to this confidence that Daniel has. Verse 21, Daniel answered, may the king live forever, which was a standard greeting. Obviously, he's not putting the king before God. It would have been a standard greeting to when you first start talking to the king or approach the king. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, faithfulness. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had, say it with me, trusted in his God. He was faithful. He knew no matter what, no matter how hard that storm beat and blew against him, he knew that his God was faithful. Sometimes things don't work out so well. I, I love the story very similar to this to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember when they were thrown into the furnace? They were like, hey, listen, God's going to take care of us. We're not really worried about this. But if God chooses not to deliver us from the furnace, like if things turn real south real fast, that's still okay because God's going to take care of us. And outsiders look at that and go, um, you died. Okay, that didn't work out so well for you. God heals no matter what. I had a conversation with somebody a couple of weeks ago, and they were telling me about a family member that was pretty sick. And navigating those conversations is difficult, and they were very, very positive in spirit, and we were talking about how faithful God is, and we, I don't lead off with this line. But we basically, in the context of the conversation, almost at the same time, said, God will bring healing either way. And I say that to say this, church, that please don't think that God, oh, okay, I'm going to accept Jesus as my Savior. He's going to make everything thing better and all the storms go away. That's not how it works. Again, God allows us to go through storms. Sometimes God doesn't deliver us from that storm. Sometimes we come out on the other end looking like that bare concrete slab. Sometimes we don't come out of the other end at all. And it's it's really tough to think about, and it's tough to understand. But see, that's not the end of the story. There is a much bigger and much 
longer story after that. So can God be faithful either way that it turns out? Absolutely, 1,000%. God will be faithful. And church, when you put that trust and that faith into God, you can look at that storm and, and, and know that there's probably not going to be a happy ending and you can smile all the way through it because you know there is something so much greater. You're going to be healed. It's just probably not in the way that you prayed for a very long time because God is faithful. So six facts about faithfulness. Number one, faithfulness results in blessing. Number two, faithfulness results in persecution or opposition. Number three, faithfulness breeds confidence. Number four, faithfulness breeds loyalty. Number five, faithfulness causes others to believe. And number six, faithfulness stands strong in the face of storms. Now, normally that would be the time where we would wrap up this message. But as I was studying this over the last couple weeks, a couple of questions popped up to me, and it wasn't necessarily that I didn't know the answer to these questions, but I always try to put myself into the story, put myself into one of those seats, and I tell you this all the time, I'm pretty much preaching to myself, and I'm glad that you guys get something from it too. But two questions really, really popped out at me that I think need to be answered that will shine a little more light onto this whole faithfulness. So here's the first question, really really simple of a question. Why was Daniel faithful to the kings who enslaved him? So remember, Daniel, our, our hero of faith here in this story, he was basically a slave. He was taken from his homeland, from Israel, from Judah, I think it's like 800 miles or so into Babylon, served under Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, some other kings. Now here we are at Darius. And a lot of us think, oh, Daniel was a young man when he was thrown at. No, this was later on in life. He was probably in his 60s or 70s, something like that. And he had served those kings so faithfully for so long. And the question is, if he was a slave to them and they basically demolished his city and his nation and took him as a captive, why would he be faithful? Because that doesn't make sense. Because I don't know that I could do that. I would probably hold some bitterness and some anger and some hostility and like, I don't want to serve you. That would be me, but that's just me. Maybe that's not you. Well, why was Daniel faithful to the kings who enslaved him? Because God commanded it. Did you know that? Did you know that God commanded Daniel to be faithful? Now, if I say Jeremiah 29, what do we think of? What verse? Verse 29, or chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We love that verse, don't we? That's a good verse, right? Like, like we probably got a little card, and that's on our mirror in our bathroom, or we got a a plaque up in our house somewhere. We love that verse. Do you guys know where that verse comes from or the back story of that verse? Jeremiah, well, you're you're, you're like, yeah, it's starting to say it right there, dummy. Okay. (laughs) Jeremiah 29, starting in verse one, it says, this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah, okay, a whole, this other prophet that Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Who would be in that list? Our boy Daniel. So this was a letter not necessarily directly to Daniel, but he was certainly one of the people that would have caught wind of this letter. Now, It goes on for another few verses, not really important to what we're going here, but verse four, here's what it says. This is directly from God. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So this is the prophet Jeremiah speaking on behalf of God, and he's saying, this is what God is saying. Number five, build houses and settle down. 
plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Now pause there just for a second. Okay. God is saying, if you're going to be there, make it work. I can get on board with that. But remember, these are the kings that conquered Israel, killed, destroyed, burned. We'll look at that here in just a second. And God says this next verse, verse 7, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, which that's about right there I would have gone, okay, Lord. Don't know if I can do that. But he says, pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. God commanded Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and all the other guys that are not mentioned, commanded them to be faithful to the people who had enslaved them. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? But see, God knows something that we don't know naturally, that we just read in Daniel chapter 6, that when we are faithful to those around us, guess what happens? They catch on. They see God through our actions. So that was the first question. Why was Daniel faithful to the kings who enslaved him? Here's the second question. Here's, this one's even bigger. Why was Daniel faithful when facing the biggest storm possible? Or how could Daniel be so faithful when he was looking at certain death in the lion's den? We're not going to read it today, but we know what happened to the guys who tried to trap Daniel, right? You know they got thrown into the lion's den, and it says pretty much before they hit the ground, they were ripped to shreds. So if Daniel knew that was a possibility and a probability, how was Daniel faithful when he faced the storm in life? You know why, church? Because God is wholly faithful to us. That's why. Because he knew what God he served. He had seen God over and over and over be faithful to him. I wrote this down. God's mercy, grace, goodness, and forgiveness never hinge on circumstances because he is always faithful. That's that thing, church. No matter what it looks like around us, those things, they have nothing to do with God's faithfulness. God is so gracious, he is so loving, he's so forgiving, and he is good. He is always, always faithful to us. The book of Lamentations is probably a book that we don't know a ton about. And it's five basically kind of like poems by Jeremiah the prophet in, in or about the year 586 B.C. Now, that doesn't mean anything to us, 586 B.C., but to them, that was like their September 11th times infinity. That's they had been conquered and dragged off into Babylon. That's when all of this stuff had happened. So the book of Lamentations is basically a eulogy of this death of a nation of Israel. And it's this very, very sad, I mean, you read it, you, just, you get depressed just from reading this book. And Jeremiah, he's, he's talking about how Jerusalem had been burned destroyed into rubble. It talks about cannibalism, and I'm going to keep it PG, but it's really, really, really bad. I mean, as bad of a picture as I can paint, 
That's what the book of Lamentations is. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. He was a really, really sensitive dude, and he is just pouring it out. But listen to this. Right in the middle of the book of Lamentations, in chapter 3, verse 19, it says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. How do you think he's feeling right now? He's feeling real good, is he? he he's like, I, I remember all of this bad stuff. But he says this, verse 21, Yet, even though I feel all of this pain and this hurt, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have, what's that word? Hope. Things were bad around him, church, but he still had hope. So how do you stay faithful when facing the biggest storm in life? Verse 22, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new, how often? Every once in a while. Uh, Sometimes when God feels up to it every morning. Church, that means we get to wake up every single morning and get a fresh start. No, our problems don't go away, but God's faithfulness is renewed every day. So it says, they are new every morning. Please read it with me. Great is your faithfulness. So good, church. How is he able to remain faithful? Because he knew of God's faithfulness. Verse 24 and 25, it says, I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. That hope, church, that's not like, I hope God works this out for me. That is, I have a hope that no matter what this storm does to me, number one, I am going to be faithful to God, and number two, God has provided eternity for me. Church, that is a hope that this world cannot offer. No no matter however many dollar signs, no matter the stuff, no matter your education, no matter your friends, the world, nothing this world has to offer even pales in comparison to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. So here's my final question. Are you building a house that is meant to last? Are you building a house that is fixed firmly on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ? Is your house, when the storm comes, or this storm that you are in the middle of right now, is your house going to stand firm? Does it have its foundation built on a rock? I've asked Jake to come up and just lead us in a song we all know very, very well, because I think it just fits what we've been singing about, or what we've been just talking about over the last two weeks. That, that my hope, this hope that I have, is built on nothing less. Like, again, no, no, none of those things that the world can offer, no, nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. Would you stand and sing with us, church? Every high and 
the stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak and made strong in the same. Church, I ask you again, are you building a house upon a foundation that will stand no matter what? And the way to do that is to be faithful to a faithful God and to trust him and to know that there is a hope that we have that cannot be compared. Father, we come to you this morning. We're just so grateful, God, that you are a firm foundation God, that no matter what happens in life, you are in control. And God, we often try to take the reins. God, help us to know that you've got this. So God, when we face storms, and again, God, I know there are so many that are in storms right now. God, help us to remain faithful. Help us to remain true to you, Lord, because you are so faithful to us. God, I pray that we live with faithfulness in a way that it causes others around us to see you. God, in our workplaces, at the store, at our hobbies, when we're just out around town, God, I pray that people see Jesus in us. God, I know this morning there may be some here that do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. They do not have a relationship with you. Right now in this moment, Lord, speak to their hearts. God, there is something missing in their lives and they know it. God, help them to know that missing thing is you. So if that's you this morning, heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you, you know that there is something missing in your life. And today's the day you want to say, Jesus, I want to put you in that hole that only you can fill. I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Just right there where you are, say, Jesus, I love you. I trust you. God, save me. God, change me. I give you my life, Lord. Be my Savior. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying so that I can live. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I'd love to know. I'm not going to call you out or anything, but I'd just love to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, this morning, I got it right. I accepted Jesus as my Savior today. I made that choice today. Maybe there's some in here that know that we have not been faithful as we are called to be. Right now, may today be the day where I say, Lord, I'm going to give my life back to you. I keep taking it away, but God, I'm giving back my life to you. Help me to be more faithful to you. 
God, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are kind. And thank you that you are so faithful to us. Great is your faithfulness. God, we pray for this time of offering. Help us to be generous so that we can go out into this world and we can further your kingdom in a way like never before. So bless this time of offering. Use it in an awesome way. We pray all this in your awesome name. Amen.